Welcome everyone. My name is Charlene Margot and I am co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture, the program that brings you the Parent Education Series now in its 16th year. We are so glad that you can be with us tonight. Um, we are going to be talking about smoking on Snapchat, talking about vapes, e-cigarettes, and tobacco with teens. We're very delighted to have with us tonight our featured speaker, Dr. Erin Vogel. Uh, but before I tell you a little bit about her, just a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, we are offering Spanish interpretation tonight with Luis Romero. So if you would like Spanish, click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and then Spanish. We will be speaking um, in English, but again, if you need Spanish, please do click on that. And directions are in Spanish in the chat. So in Espanol in the chat, if you would like interpretation tonight. We know that this is an important and timely topic, especially now during the pandemic with more than a hundred people registered. Uh, we realize that this is something that is much on parents' minds. As always, we are grateful to our sponsors, including San Mateo County Office of Education's TUPE program. That's the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Program, the Sequoia Healthcare District, Peninsula Healthcare District, Sequoia Union High School District, San Mateo Unified Union High School District, and this organization, The Parent Venture. Uh, special thanks to tonight's presenter, Dr. Aaron Vogel. We are going to have about 60 minutes together. Aaron will be speaking for 40, 45 minutes, and then we want to open it up to you, the audience, for some questions. Uh, we have tonight, since this is a webinar format, we have both the chat and the Q&A buttons. Again, my partner Bev will be putting resources in the chat, so feel free to uh, message us or one another and look for those links in the chat. If you have questions, please do put them in the Q&A button. We promise to get to as many of your questions as we can tonight. We have some that have come in earlier from the audience, but again, questions in the chat, we look forward to hearing from all of you. At the very end of the program, there will be a very quick survey in the chat. We hope that you'll take two minutes to fill that in. It really helps us with our grant funding and planning for future events. We promise we read everyone. And I know that you're tired of getting uh, survey requests from Target and Walmart, but if you have a minute, we would appreciate it very much. Let's see what else. In conclusion, also, I'd like to say that this event is being recorded. We appreciate Dr. Vogel giving her permission to, for us to do that. We have a very active video library. Our YouTube channel has had more than 35,000 views, including 20,000 in 2020 alone. So we know that for those of you who can't join us online live or would like to share this with a spouse or a partner or one of your children, the videos are available on the video library. There's also a separate um, category for Spanish language videos. So do check those out as well. Um, okay. Let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenter. Dr. Erin Vogel is a senior research associate at the University of Southern California, Keck School of Medicine. Her research interests include youth tobacco use, social media and digital health, and tobacco use disparities in the LGBTQ community. She completed postdoctoral fellowships at UCSF and Stanford University prior to moving to USC in 2021. Outside of lab, Erin loves cooking, hiking, spending time with family and friends and exploring all that Southern California has to offer. We will not hold it against her for being at USC now. <laughs> Erin, thank you so much. We are grateful to you tonight. So please take it away. All right, thank you, Charlene. Thank you so much for having me. And I really appreciate everybody's time tonight. I know that we all have very busy schedules these days. I will go ahead and share my slides. Oops. Okay. Perfect. Charlene, are you able to tell me if that's not working properly? Looks, looks just perfect. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so yes, thank you everybody um, for taking the time to be with me tonight. And before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about my goal for this webinar. So. My goal is not to give you any more to worry about than you already have. I know we've all been through a lot lately, especially with the latest surge in COVID cases, and we all have a lot of things to stress out about. I hope that I can give you some information and some tools to empower you to have conversations with your children about these issues and to do what's best for your family. 
Um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, thank you, Charlene, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I did live in the Bay Area for four years when I was competing, uh, when I was completing fellowships at UCSF and at Stanford. Um, so I'm very familiar with the community and um, very happy to be speaking with you tonight. Um, I have a longstanding interest in how technology, particularly social media, affects young people's well-being and their health behaviors, especially e-cigarette use or vaping, which is a lot of what I'll be talking about tonight. So I'll give you an overview of vaping and social media use and how those issues intersect, and then we will have some time for questions. So what exactly is vaping? Vaping devices heat liquids that are called e-liquids in order to form an aerosol, which users then inhale. And what we actually see is when users exhale a cloud of vapor, like you see in this picture here. And some devices produce bigger clouds of vapor than others. So for some, you'll see big clouds of vapor that almost looks like smoke. You might see people doing tricks with that vapor. And some devices are more discreet and they produce smaller clouds of vapor. And these are a little bit easier to hide. So what it actually looks like depends a lot on the device that the user is using. And e-liquids are often flavored. They taste like fruit or candy or mint. And these flavors are known to appeal to children and teenagers. For that reason, flavors have been banned in cigarettes for quite a while. But a lot, um, are, a lot of flavored e-cigarettes are still on the market and still being sold um, and distributed to underage users. Many e-liquids contain nicotine, which is the addictive chemical in cigarettes. And a lot of people who use e-cigarettes don't know the nicotine content that they're vaping. So they might be vaping something that just tastes like raspberry, but it actually has this very addictive nicotine in it. Also, some e-cigarettes or vaping products contain cannabis or marijuana oil. So these are more similar to smoking marijuana than to smoking cigarettes in terms of the effect that they produce or the high that they produce for the user. And vaping cannabis can come with its own risks, which I'll talk about. Teen vaping has become a major problem in recent years to the point that the Surgeon General declared it an epidemic in 2018 at the height of teen vaping. So looking at this graph on the left here, we can see trends in any tobacco product use from 1999 all the way on the left up to data from 2020. And we can see that tobacco use really started declining. And then when e-cigarettes became popular, more kids started using tobacco products. So this rise around 2018, 2019 was mostly driven by the popularity of e-cigarettes. One encouraging thing is that the prevalence of smoking has really decreased over time. So you can see how cigarette use has kind of steadily fallen um, since 1999. Cigars, although less common, are also used by teenagers. And prevalence of cigar use has kind of gradually gone down as well, similar to cigarettes. However, when we look at e-cigarettes, which were first introduced to the US around this time in 2011, they became extremely popular around 2018 and peaking in 2019, this yellow bar here. So in 2019, 27.5% of high school students reported that they had used e-cigarettes in the past month, meaning that even more had used in the past year or in their lifetime. Thankfully, this went down a little bit. Um, in 2020, 19.6% of high school students reported that they had used e-cigarettes recently, and it actually dropped a lot in 2021. So in this most recent survey, only 11.3% of high school students said they had used e-cigarettes in the past month. Now that is still very concerning. If we think about how many high school students there are in the United States, that's still a lot of kids who are using e-cigarettes. We also don't know if changes in the way the survey was administered might have influenced how kids were responding. So in 2021, because a lot of schools were operating online, the survey was done online. Kids were at home with their parents and they might not have been as truthful as they would have um, if they were in another setting. 
So it's unclear uh, what's driving this decrease in vaping and how it might change as more students return to school in person. So it's very good news, but we need to continue monitoring what happens with that trend. Vaping cannabis or marijuana is a little bit less common. Um, according to a 2021 national survey, 12% of 12th grade students uh, reported that they had vaped cannabis in the past month. And that's a little bit less than it was before the pandemic, but we didn't see that steep drop that we saw with nicotine vaping. Anyone can be at risk for initiating vaping, but when we look at the demographics of teenagers who vape, we do see that some teens are more likely to vape than others. So males are more likely to vape than females. White and Hispanic or Latinx teenagers are more likely to vape than teenagers of other races and ethnicities. Teenagers who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or another sexual minority or gender minority identity are more likely to vape. Teens from higher income households are more likely to vape, although this has changed as e-cigarettes have gotten more popular. There are some social influences on vaping. Teenagers who live with somebody in the household who vapes are more likely to vape themselves, perhaps because it seems more normal to them or because they have more access to vaping products in their household. And teens who already are smoking cigarettes are more likely to vape. They are already using nicotine, they're already familiar with inhaling tobacco products, and that might drive them to be more likely to use e-cigarettes. Vaping might help some adults quit smoking. A lot of people um, who have been smoking for years and have trouble quitting but want to quit have said that vaping does help them quit. And the science is still inconclusive on whether or not vaping helps a lot of adults quit smoking, but the evidence overwhelmingly shows that it's bad for teenagers to vape, and there are a lot of risks. So teenagers who vape are at a higher risk of smoking cigarettes. Even teenagers who don't have other risk factors for smoking and who probably would not smoke are more likely to smoke if they've been using e-cigarettes. And again, this might be because um, smoking and vaping become more normal to them, or because they get addicted to nicotine. And if they can't get vaping products or they want more nicotine, they might try cigarettes. Even for those who don't end up using cigarettes, vaping does carry risks of exposure to toxicants. So there are thousands of e-cigarette flavors on the market and they contain a lot of chemicals that we're not entirely certain what all of them are. Um, there is very little regulation and flavorings that are approved by the FDA as safe to eat might not be safe to inhale. So our lungs are really delicate. And just because something is approved as a flavoring doesn't mean that it's okay to put it in a vape and inhale it and to have it be safe. There are substances such as formaldehyde and acetaldehyde um, that can cause health problems that have been found in vaping products. And fine particles get into the lungs, um, which can cause breathing problems. There are some short-term cardiovascular effects or effects on the heart um, from vaping. So the nicotine can cause an elevated heart rate and blood pressure, and there may be long-term effects as well, although we don't have as much data on that because vaping products have not been around for very long. Teens are at higher risk for getting addicted to nicotine than adults. Developing brains are more sensitive to nicotine and more vulnerable to addiction. So even teens who are not using vaping products very frequently might start to develop some symptoms of addiction. And I'll talk more about what um, addiction can look like. Teenagers are also at risk for um, escalation from just light use of vaping products to regular use. So some teenagers do just experiment with vaping products and it never becomes a habit for them and they don't get addicted to nicotine. But others do. They might start out using socially or just occasionally when they feel stressed and they may end up using vaping products regularly. And once that starts, it can be very hard to stop. There is also a small risk of injury from exploding devices. This is very, very rare, but there have been reports of e-cigarette devices exploding and causing burns and other injuries. 
And there's also a risk of serious lung injury um, known as EVALI or e-cigarette or vaping induced lung injury. And EVALI led to 2,807 people being hospitalized and 68 deaths between March, 2019 and February, 2020. So this was just prior to and at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And symptoms are ones that have become familiar to all of us during the pandemic. Shortness of breath, cough, fever, tachycardia, or fast heart rate. It can cause people to become seriously ill. And most of these cases have been linked to vitamin E acetate, which is an additive that's sometimes put into vaping products. And these, this is usually put into cannabis vaping products rather than nicotine vaping products. And most cases have been linked to cannabis products that were not sold legally. So not cannabis products that people purchased in dispensaries, but ones they got through other means. However, there have been some cases where the person has reported that they were not using cannabis vaping and that they were just vaping nicotine and still developed this lung injury. So it may still be possible, but the majority of these cases seem to be linked to vitamin E. It's helpful for parents to have an idea of what vaping products look like because they often don't look like cigarettes and they often don't look like anything harmful at all. So Juul was among the first vaping products to become popular with teenagers. And that was partly because it is so discreet. So these little Juul pods, one of these pods here contains as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. And it's very, very small. The device itself looks like a USB flash drive. So if you see this on a child's desk or in their backpack, it might not be something that you would immediately be suspicious of. It might just look like school supplies. There are other similar devices um, such as Sorin and Smoke. These are known as PodMod devices. They're small, they have pre-filled cartridges that come in different flavors. And again, they're really easy to hide. They don't produce those big clouds of vapor. They don't necessarily look like anything harmful at all. And most recently, disposable flavored products such as Puff Bar have become increasingly popular with teenagers. So these just look like little rectangles. They're very small, they come in different flavors. And again, they're really easy for kids to hide. So these products generally contain nicotine. Um, Puff Bar and Juul always contain nicotine. Um, most e-cigarettes do, although it is possible to fill them with just flavor only. And cannabis can be added to these products as well. And one question that's on many parents' minds is how to tell if your child is vaping. So unlike cigarettes, which you might smell on your child's clothes, the smells from vaping products don't linger. They dissolve into the air very quickly. So it can be helpful to look for behavioral signs and to look for vaping devices like the ones I just showed. So here are some signs that a child or an adult might be becoming addicted to vaping nicotine. Symptoms of dependence or addiction include needing to vape more and more to get the same effects. So somebody might start getting a little bit of a buzz from nicotine just from vaping a small amount, and then they find that they need more and more of that product to get the same effect. And this can lead to vaping more than they intended to vape. So they might try to set limits and find it really hard to stick to those limits. And even when somebody wants to cut down on vaping or quit vaping, if they're addicted to nicotine, they might find that it's very hard to do. And self-control is really not enough and they might need help in order to be able to quit. People who are becoming addicted to nicotine also experience withdrawal symptoms frequently. And withdrawal symptoms are symptoms that occur when they do not have access to nicotine or vaping products. So when they're not able to vape, they might experience strong cravings or urges to vape. They might find it hard to focus on anything else, which can lead to difficulty concentrating in school for kids. It also can lead to mood symptoms, such as feeling irritable, sad, anxious. If you've ever quit smoking or you know anyone who's quit smoking, this might sound familiar because it's that same addictive chemical in e-cigarettes that we find in cigarettes. And so it produces a lot of the same symptoms 
And it can be really hard for people, teenagers or adults, to quit. It's important to note that some of these symptoms like difficulty concentrating or mood concerns aren't specific to nicotine withdrawal. So there can be a lot of different things that are causing these symptoms. And your child experiencing these symptoms doesn't necessarily mean that they're vaping, but it could be a sign that something is going on. Thanks to the hard work of many concerned parents, educators, scientists, public health professionals, vaping products are increasingly becoming regulated. And the goal of public health is to protect children from exposure to harmful products, while also preserving options for adults who want to quit smoking. And that's a really delicate balance. And one way that regulation has tried to find that balance is by focusing on flavors, because we know that flavored products really attract kids. So in 2020, flavors were banned in closed pod systems at the federal level. And closed pod systems are products like Juul, where they come with a pre-filled cartridge with e-liquid. It's not the kind where you put your own e-liquid into a device. So that's a pretty narrow class of products that has that regulation. Technically, no e-cigarette products have been approved by the FDA, but a lot have been allowed to remain on the market while their applications for um, approval are pending. It's also important to note that the purchasing age in 2020 uh, for tobacco products was increased to 21 nationwide. So some states, including California, already required people to be 21 to be able to legally purchase tobacco products. But now that's true across the country. And we know that age regulations like that can be helpful in protecting kids. There have also been regulatory efforts more locally. So you can keep an eye out for California law SB 793. This is a bill that would prohibit flavors in tobacco products, and it will be on the ballot in November 2022. So coming up this year for voters. There are also several jurisdictions in San Mateo County, um, such as Menlo Park and East Palo Alto, that restrict the sale of e-cigarettes or restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products. And San Francisco in January 2020 actually banned the sale of all e-cigarettes until they're approved by the FDA. And that was um, some of the strongest regulatory action taken across the country. Quitting vaping can be really tough, but there are resources available to help teenagers or adults who want to quit. Truth Initiative is a well-respected organization that has a quit vaping program that's specifically geared toward teens. And there's a number that you can text, I have it here on the screen, in order to get started with that program. There are also online resources through smokefree.gov, which is from the National Cancer Institute, and that provides resources for parents, teens, or anybody else who wants to quit smoking or vaping. There's also the California Tobacco Quit Line, um, which you can call or visit their website for help and for resources. And all of these resources are available free of charge. If you're concerned about your child's vaping or other tobacco use, you can also talk to your pediatrician. Medications that are available for adults, like the nicotine patch or gum or lozenge, are not available over the counter for teenagers, but if a pediatrician believes that it could help your child, they might choose to prescribe it. So it's definitely worth talking to your doctor as well if you're concerned. Thinking about our respiratory health has become more important than ever right now. And there are a lot of unanswered questions about how smoking and vaping affect risk for COVID-19. There have been some studies that show that people who smoke or vape are at greater risk for getting COVID or for having serious complications. And other studies have not shown that. And some have even shown the opposite. So we're really not sure yet how all of those factors interact. But again, we do know that smoking and vaping are very harmful for teenagers' health. There's also a lot of interest in how teen vaping might have changed as a result of the pandemic and shelter in place restrictions. So in a national study, 55% of youth who had reported vaping recently said that they had changed their vaping behavior since COVID-19 started. 
37 of them, 37% of them, excuse me, said that they had quit vaping. 31% reduced their vaping and only 17% increased their vaping. So this is somewhat encouraging and that a lot of kids were saying that they did actually cut down or quit on vaping um, during the pandemic. However, there was a larger national study that found that most teenagers who had vaped in the past year said their vaping had not changed, that it had stayed the same. So that really big drop we saw in the prevalence of teenagers vaping from uh, 2020 to 2021, that was mostly driven by the fact that teenagers weren't starting to vape at the same rate that they had been previously. So not that many were quitting. It was more that they weren't starting to vape, which is also great news, but suggests that teenagers who were already vaping might have trouble quitting. Teenagers in that study um, shared their reasons for either increasing their vaping or decreasing their vaping. And top reasons for increasing vaping included boredom, stress, need for distraction, issues that we're probably all familiar with that have come up for us during the pandemic. And teenagers also had reasons for decreasing their vaping. So many said that they were concerned about the health of their lungs during the COVID-19 pandemic. Many said that they were unable to get vaping products. So they either got their vaping products at school or when they were hanging out with friends. And then because of social distancing, they were not able to vape like they used to. And many were concerned that their parents would find out about vaping because they were spending so much time at home, they were worried about getting in trouble and that led to them decreasing their vaping or quitting. So a lot of teenagers who continued vaping or started vaping likely were doing so partly to cope with the stress of the pandemic. And teens have unfortunately reported really large increases in anxiety, boredom, sadness, and loneliness in 2021 as the pandemic continued on. So COVID-19 has really changed a lot of how we cope with things um, and has led a lot of teenagers to resort to substance use in order to cope. But there are some encouraging signs as well, such as that decrease in the prevalence of vaping nationwide. And COVID has also changed a lot about how we socialize, of course, as a lot of our social lives have moved online. Um, so that leads me to the next topic that I wanna talk about, which is social media something that many of us have used a lot of during the pandemic. There are a lot of social media platforms that are popular with teenagers. Um, these are some of the ones that are most popular right now. Instagram allows sharing of photos and videos with users who follow you or who choose to view your account. And posts can be saved either to somebody's account where their viewers can see them all the time or saved to stories, which are only available for 24 hours. So they're short-term ways to share photos and videos. Snapchat is also popular among teenagers and it's best known for having content that disappears quickly. Messages that are sent to others or that are posted to the user's story are only available temporarily unless somebody takes a screenshot of it. TikTok was already popular with teenagers before the pandemic and has become a lot more popular with adults during the pandemic as well. And TikTok allows users to share short videos either with their own audio soundtrack or with audio that they've taken from somebody else and they add their own video to it. And Facebook has a reputation for being more popular with adults than with teenagers. And while that is true, most teenagers do still have a Facebook account they might not use it as frequently as these other platforms. And social media has both positive and negative effects on teenagers. Some positive effects include being able to connect with friends, which I think has become increasingly important during social distancing. Social media is also a means of self-expression. When we use social media, we can build our own profiles, we can post the pictures that we're happiest with or most proud of, share moments in our lives that we're happy about, we can really build our identity and express ourselves to others using social media. And social media can also be great for entertainment. 
if you're bored and you have a little bit of time to kill, it's easy to just log on to social media, which can be a good thing or can also become a negative habit, depending on how you look at it and how often you use it. Unfortunately, there are some negative effects of social media on teenagers as well. And these are the effects that I think tend to get more attention, which is why I do like to note the positives as well. One negative outcome is comparing ourselves to others. When we look at people's social media profiles, we're seeing what they choose to share. We're essentially seeing a highlight reel of other people's lives. We're seeing the pictures that they feel they look best in. We're seeing the moments that they're proud of. We're seeing what they choose to share with us. And even if we know that, we often forget that when we're using social media and we compare our real lives to idealized versions of other people's lives and feel bad about ourselves as a result. And this can happen to social media users of all ages, but is especially common um, for younger people. Younger people also can experience cyberbullying on social media. It's a lot easier to say things to somebody online that you wouldn't necessarily say to their face. So people can get really mean comments from others on social media. And again, this is something that can happen to people of any age, but is especially common among younger people. And social media also allows teenagers to see content that normalizes harmful behavior, including vaping or e-cigarette use. And this is something that I was really interested in because we have some research showing that teenagers who use social media more intensely are more likely to vape. But I wanted to hear from teenagers in their own words, what they're seeing related to vaping on social media and how they think it affects them. So I interviewed 30 teenagers in California in fall of 2020 about the vaping related content that they see on social media and how they think it affects them and affects other people. I did all these interviews on Zoom with the help of a fantastic uh, graduate student I was working with. And then we reviewed the transcripts of those conversations to help us identify some common themes in participant responses. We wanted to look at these 30 different interviews and see what was coming up frequently. So we have some key takeaway messages from those interviews. Most of the 30 teenagers that we interviewed reported that they had never vaped themselves. And despite that, almost all of them had seen vaping related content on social media. So even if they didn't vape and even if their friends didn't vape, this was still something that they were seeing. And a few teenagers shared that their peers often had different social media accounts that they used for different purposes. And this person described it as, people usually have two different Instagrams, one where they post all their wholly appropriate stuff, and then they have another account. And that's where I follow a lot of them. They smoke. It's not only vaping, it's weed, but it's just, yeah, you know, I see a lot of it, a lot of vaping. We asked teenagers why they believe their peers post about vaping. And one common response was that they think that other teenagers are posting about vaping in order to show off and in order to convey a certain image. One teenager said, it's this rebellious nature to it, or you could say carefree nature. I think that's what social media is all about, expressing who you are and what you fit into. And I think people might bring vaping or alcohol or marijuana into that to add another dimension to who they are. So this person is really explaining how people express themselves on social media and how substance use, particularly vaping, might be a part of that self that they're trying to portray. Other teenagers said that they think their peers are just documenting daily life, that vaping is just a part of what they do and they're not trying to show off or portray any certain image. They're just showing what they're doing. One person explained it like this. Snapchat is moments of your day. You'd be like, oh, grabbing lunch. And then someone would be like, look, we're all jeweling in the bathroom, referring to using the e-cigarette jewel. It makes it seem like, oh, this is a part of my life. 
This is casual, no big deal. And a lot of teenagers did speak about how vaping on social media just seems like a normal part of daily life and not like they're trying to send any sort of message. One thing to be aware of is that several teenagers also said they've seen vaping products for sale on social media. So you can see the screenshot from TikTok where somebody is selling puff bars, those disposable e-cigarettes that have become very popular for $10. And they're advertising free shipping and that they don't check for an ID to check that somebody is not underage. And one person explained how this happens at their school. They said, there's this place nearby that sells vape pens to underage kids. So those kids will go and get a stock of it and then resell it on social media. Like how many do you want? And then they'll pay for it. It's like a chain in that sense. And they describe this chain as a key way that teenagers at their school get vaping products through social media. We also asked participants how they believe vaping related content on social media might affect them or might affect other teenagers. And a lot of them said they believe that it helps normalize vaping, that when they see other teenagers vaping all the time, it just starts to seem like something that everybody does. One person explained it like this. They were referring not just to vaping, but substance use in general. They said, when one person uses substances, then it starts a whole thing where they post it on social media and then their friends see it and they do it and it's a whole thing. It's like an avalanche. Once it starts, it doesn't stop rolling until everyone's taken down. I think the last part of that quote really shows their awareness of how social media content can affect them and can affect their friends. Another teenager said, social media has perpetuated the idea that vaping is what one needs to do to be relevant and popular, when in reality it shouldn't be. It's sending the message that vaping is a way to fit in and be like everyone else. I think it's worth noting that most teenagers I talked to spoke specifically about how vaping content on social media affects other people. And many were sure to say that it wouldn't affect their own choices. They saw it as something that affects other people, but that they were able to resist it, which might be true, or it might be a little bit of a blind spot in their self-awareness. A lot did also express concern for people younger than them and how vaping content might affect them. A lot said that they had siblings in middle school, or other younger people in their life, and they were really concerned about them seeing this vaping content from older teenagers and being influenced by it. During these interviews, we asked them about their reactions to vaping related content, and we were sure to tell them that we weren't judging them for any response they had, and we just wanted their honest thoughts about how they reacted to this content. And teenagers had very nuanced and mixed responses to that question. A lot expressed curiosity, disapproval, indifference, or some combination. A lot had multiple responses. In terms of curiosity, one person shared, well, the first thing I saw was a flash drive. And then I was like, oh, it's a jewel. At first I was like, oh, I want to do that. I did think that. And then I tried it and I was like, this is literally nothing. So this was somebody who had tried vaping. They didn't like it. It wasn't something they did regularly, but they're saying that social media did have an influence in their decision to try it. Other teenagers, particularly ones who saw vaping as a way of showing off, disapproved of this content. One person said, what are you bragging about really if you're using e-cigarettes, which are really unhealthy and bad for your lungs? What is there to brag about with that? And some just expressed indifference. One said, I didn't really have a reaction because it's normalized for me. So I don't really see a problem with it. But if I were to show my parents, it would be something like, what, what are they doing? So many teenagers said that they had already seen their friends vaping or they had already seen vaping products at school. So when they saw it on social media, it seemed like no big deal. There are several ways that you can approach conversations with your kids about social media, vaping content, and what they're seeing on social media. 
And I want to preface this by saying that you know your family best, and these are just some kind of general guidelines for starting a conversation if you're unsure of where to start. One way to start a conversation is by asking your kids about what they're seeing on social media. So they probably won't want to talk about what they might be posting on social media. They might not want to share what their friends are posting, but they might be willing to talk about just content that they've seen on social media. And that can open a conversation to talk about their own thoughts about what they're seeing and how they might be affected by it. I think it's also important to acknowledge the reality of teenagers' experiences and acknowledge the gray area and the complexity of talking about vaping and other substance use. Teenagers get a lot of messages from adults that substance use of all kinds is bad and is harmful and is something that they shouldn't do, which is true, but then they see people using substances and not having those negative consequences right away. So for example, it can be confusing to hear that drinking is really bad and then to see their parents drinking in moderation and have that be okay. So when you're talking with kids about vaping or other substance use, it can be helpful to acknowledge that these issues are complicated. So drinking in moderation might be okay for most adults, but there are reasons that it's harmful for teenagers. And similarly with tobacco use, not everyone who smokes or vapes is going to become addicted. So they might have seen friends or classmates who do vape in moderation and don't seem to be having problems from it. But that doesn't mean that the vaping is not having negative effects on those people. So it's good to acknowledge what they're seeing and really engage with these issues to the extent that you can, instead of just making blanket statements about something being harmful. And I acknowledge that this can be really hard to do and it is a complicated issue. In terms of social media use, it's worth considering setting family rules or guidelines around social media use. And there's no one size fits all answer to doing this. Different guidelines work for different families. So some parents might have a rule that their children can't use social media in the evening until they finish their homework. Or maybe you're okay with your children having social media accounts, but you want to see those accounts. You want to have access to them. And it's worth thinking about what you feel comfortable with and what might work for your family and having these ongoing conversations. So just to wrap up with some final thoughts, we know overwhelmingly from scientific research that vaping is harmful for teenagers and unfortunately is still pretty common, even though it has decreased last year. And parents can help prevent teen vaping by being aware of the signs of vaping, being aware of the different devices and talking to your families early and often about vaping. So even children who are in middle school are often exposed to vaping related issues and products, um, either at school or through older siblings or through the media, and they might have questions about it even at a young age. And social media has both positive and negative effects on teenagers and on adults. And there's really no one size fits all solution for healthy social media use. I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and here is my contact information as well. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me after the presentation or anytime if questions come up um, or if you don't get your questions answered tonight. Um, but with that, I see Charlene is back on. So I will stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Vogel. I really appreciate the really practical strategies that you offered parents, especially around starting conversations. You know, our, we know our teenagers are smart. And if you're trying to do things in a top-down system with absolutes, doesn't usually work that well, does it? Yes, agreed. So the gray area, the gray area, nuance, messaging, that's an important part of this. So let's start with a great question um, from a parent who asks, do you think that vaping decreased during shelter in place due to a reduction in the social factor of being the cool guy? It's a really good question. I think that there are probably a lot of reasons uh, related to kids' social lives and how those have changed. So I think that that can certainly be part of it. We know that 
trends change over time and vaping is not as cool as it used to be. I saw an article just this past week in the New York Times addressing the issue of cigarette smoking possibly becoming considered cool again among younger people, which is concerning because that's even more harmful than vaping. So that's definitely something to keep an eye on. So we know that trends change over time and also kids, unfortunately, were not seeing their peers as much. Um, so although that isolation has had a lot of negative effects, it may have had some positive effects on vaping. So one thing we hear is that when kids were at home, the availability of getting vape products decreased, but now they're back at school. Are you worried that that means the numbers are gonna go back up again? I am. I don't know that they'll go back up to where they were, um, for example, in 2019, because those trends have changed over time too. So vaping just might not be as popular as it used to be, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see those numbers start to go back up um, as kids are back in school and have more access to products again. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this parent asked, and I think, I think this is a worry, um, she says, our kids don't vape at home, but we believe that they're vaping in social situations and at school. What signs should we look for? Yeah, it can be harder when um, you're not, when they're mostly vaping in situations where you're not physically there, because like I mentioned, it's not um, like cigarette smoke where, where the smell lingers. So I think that looking for vaping devices um, is one good way to do that which does not necessarily mean tear apart your child's room looking for these things, but being aware of what they look like um, can be helpful. Um, and yes, looking for signs that, um, that they might be having difficulty not vaping when they're not in social situations. Um, so things like moodiness and difficulty concentrating um, can be signs. And also just getting to know their friends. Of course, that's not um, a surefire way to tell if, if their friends are vaping or if they're vaping with their friends, um, but just some kind of general knowledge of, um, of what their friends might be doing can be helpful, but it can be hard um, because those signs don't linger like they do with cigarettes. And it's not always as obvious um, if a child has been using nicotine as it might be, for example, if they come home after drinking, nicotine yeah. isn't necessarily as obvious. So it can be a little bit hard to tell. Yeah, it's, I think the days are over where we used to be advising parents to just smell the breath of kids when they come home. Yeah. It's not as easy, is it? Right. So e-cigarettes, sometimes they do produce a smell. Um, so if they're fruit flavored, they might produce a fruit smell, but it'll go away very quickly. It won't linger in the air. It won't linger on their clothing. So those signs are not as obvious with vaping. Okay, so here's a practical question. I like this. Parent asks, what is the point of the smoke in the exhalation of vapor? Is it about imitation of cigarette smoke or what? Why is that cool? Mm, yeah, a lot of people do like the way that it looks um, on YouTube, especially, and other social media platforms. There are a lot of videos of people doing what are called vape tricks. So they're actually yeah. making shapes with the vapor. Um, especially with those devices that produce the big clouds of vapor. Um, so some people do like the aesthetics of it. Um, some adults who used to smoke cigarettes find that that's part of the experience for them that makes it more satisfying because it imitates cigarettes. And this is what's so hard about regulating vaping products is that we want them to be an alternative to smoking for adults, but we don't want them to appeal to kids. So some of the same factors that appeal to adults, unfortunately, also do appeal to kids. So again, Dr. Vogel, we know that we parents have sometimes more influence than we think, but still we not, may not be the experts that our kids are gonna go to. Is there any website or group that kids would listen to or would look at in terms of information about vaping? It's very worrisome when you talk about the health impacts on lungs, especially for student athletes. Definitely, and that is something that a lot of kids are concerned about. Yeah, A lot of teenagers are, are very aware of their health and are very concerned about the health effects of vaping. Actually, a lot of the teenagers in my study mentioned that, especially those 
who were athletes. Um, yes, as far as resources for learning more about vaping, um, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids um, is a good one. Um, there are also resources for parents available um, through parentsagainstvaping.org. Um, and I'd be happy to put together a list too. There are a lot of great resources out there. Um, and even the National Cancer Institute, um, their smokefree.org website or smokefree.gov website um, has some resources. Um, so it can be hard to get kids to sit down and read informational right, right. things. Um, there are also uh, resources made by teenagers for teenagers. Um, so there's a group, I believe it's called Jewelers Against Jewel, um, made by children or by teenagers who used to vape and who quit um, talking about why they quit. Um, and also the FDA has some campaigns um, that they run um, ads on social media geared toward teenagers um, conveying the, the dangers. So kids who are using social media, which is most kids, um, they do see some of those messages as well um, in a way that's geared toward them. So you talked about social media and how kids may be seeing people vaping online, whether or not they actually have done it. Mm -hmm. One parent is asking about influencers. Like mm -hmm. he says, my kids listen to everything they say. I mean, as a parent, you know that your kids are watching these favorites, whether they're in health or workouts or just funny TikToks. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the best response when those influencers are showing themselves vaping? What, what should a parent do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so influencers are people who are often paid to promote products, um, but it's not like traditional advertising in some ways because they really share a lot about their lives and they become these figures that a lot of teenagers really look up to and yeah. are interested in. So I think that having those conversations goes beyond just vaping. I think that it's important to talk to kids about influencers and that they're paid advertisers. Um, influencer marketing is kind of sneaky in that it really does not seem like advertising. But one thing that, that teenagers are really receptive to is that they don't want to be told what to do and they don't want to be tricked into doing anything. Yeah. And that's essentially what advertising does to us. It persuades us to do things and to buy things um, that we might not otherwise want to do. So I think that it's really important to have those conversations with teenagers about influencers and how, even though it seems like you're getting a glimpse into their real lives, they ultimately are promoting products and they're being paid to do that. And they're only sharing what they want to share. So you have any suggestions about how to find resources that help teens do that? That would be a great thing, Erin. You maybe have a site or two that we could send to parents. That would be yeah, great. Sure, sure. It reminds me of the video where they turn a slice of pizza into a girl. You know, we're trying to convince teens that everything that they see online is not real yeah. necessarily. Right? Yes, yes, um, yes. I can share some resources just on what's called digital literacy or media literacy in general, um, which I think is something that's so important for teenagers. Absolutely. We have talked about that and we're going to do more. With Great. It. Great. We really like, namely, the National Association of Media Literacy Education. Yeah. If parents don't know that, namely.net, that's a great organization. Right, here's, here's a practical question, um, Dr. Vogel, back to sort of the legal side of this and how much kids have exposure. Um, because of the restriction of sales to persons of 21 years old or more, could a kid get into legal trouble selling products online or on campus? Good mm. It's a good question. Yeah, so those laws, um, they're ultimately aimed at retailers. So selling products, to underage people um, is illegal for a retailer? That's an excellent question about, so if the person selling was underage and yeah. it was online, um, I, I would have to look into that. And it might vary by state. I don't know exactly what the, the penalty would be for that. Okay, because I think about like you saying that kids or whoever could buy up products and then resell them through social media. And I'm assuming they'd use some money transfer like Venmo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. So the retailer who sold to underage kids could definitely be in legal trouble for that. Um, I don't know exactly in California um, what the consequences would be for an underage person selling online, but it's a great question. All right. Here's a question that just really, you know, they're asking for some advice. Mm -hmm. a parent says, we have a zero tolerance policy for substance use in our house. No alcohol, no cannabis, no vapes, et cetera. I think, or our kids think we are too strict and that all their friends are using, are they? No, that's a common misconception um, for teenagers. And actually it's really common in college students too. Um, younger people often think that all of their peers are drinking or smoking or vaping um, or using cannabis and they really overestimate the number who are doing that. So it is possible that for a certain teenager in their friend group, maybe a lot of their friends are using, but overall um, the, it's a minority who are using regularly. Um, now the exact statistics depend on the age group, the substance being used, the frequency, um, but for the most part, kids really tend to overestimate um, how many people are using and very, very reasonable to have a zero tolerance policy. You know, we've seen that even in San Mateo County where those, the social norms research is powerful, but a teen group may come and do a presentation and say, you know what, all the kids are vaping, whereas really it's, as you say, maybe it's 11%. It's a lot more powerful to say to kids, you know, actually 90% are not. Are not, exactly. And to frame right. it that way, the, the majority, 90% are not vaping. Yeah. Right. So, so even vaping, though we know, oh, I'm, I apologize. No, no, go ahead. Even though we know teen vaping is a big problem and there are, the sheer number of kids who are vaping is a lot higher than we want it to be, the vast majority are not vaping. And that is really important to recognize and important for teenagers to recognize. So you think it's good to share that kind of data with teens? Yes, I think so. A lot do um, overestimate how many of their peers are vaping. Okay, that is a really good idea. So here's a parent who says, um, my kid says that it's okay because they only vape on the weekends, so they're not really doing very much damage. Do you buy that? I don't. I understand the logic, but unfortunately yeah. for teenagers, really any vaping is harmful. Um, even after just a handful of times of using nicotine, either through vaping or cigarettes, teenagers can start to develop symptoms of addiction. Whereas with adults, it takes a lot more nicotine use to get those same symptoms. Also, there's just a lot that we don't know because these products haven't been around for very long. We, it looks like there are some health consequences of it, even in small doses, um, especially for younger people, but there could be a lot that we don't know long-term as well. So it's not great for kids to be experimenting on themselves when we don't have that data. So we know that, for example, we're learning more. In the beginning, I think kids were saying to adults in their lives, it's just water vapor, no big deal. I think as you mentioned tonight, we know that there's a lot of chemicals. It's like spraying hairspray, what's in that canister, right? Um, what are you most worried about with kids and vapes when you're talking about it being damaging or toxic for teens? Yeah, mostly the nicotine um, because once you develop an addiction to nicotine, it's not impossible to break that. Many people do, but it is something that people often struggle with um, for decades. So a lot of the stories that we hear are about cases like vaping related lung injury, where young people end up in the hospital and on ventilators. And those are serious, serious concerns. Um, but I think that the most common concern really is the nicotine exposure. If you have a child who has been vaping, product has nicotine, and they want to quit, would you start with professional advice? Would you start with the pediatrician? Or what do you think? Yeah, I think it's always good practice for something like this um, to go to your pediatrician and get advice. And there's a lot that we don't know about how to best help teenagers quit vaping. Um, medications that help adults quit smoking don't seem to be as effective in helping teenagers. It's for teenagers, it's a lot of um, a lot of behavioral changes. 
Um, so this can mean like getting rid of vaping products, um, having some accountability um, for quitting, um, which uh, families can help with. Um, getting help with underlying issues, if they're vaping to cope with stress or with mental health concerns, addressing those underlying issues can make a big difference. And just supporting your kids. Um, I think a lot of times the first instinct is to go to discipline, um, but kids also need support. And nicotine addiction in particular is really a challenge to deal with. Um, and it can go beyond just a disciplinary issue. It can be a sign of an underlying concern that needs some attention. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Vogel. That is a, a great point to end on. I think that is really wonderful advice. With your permission, could we share the slide that had the cessation resources? Yes, absolutely. Okay, that would be great. So again, I want to thank all of you who joined us tonight. You really stuck with us. I know that we could tell that this was an interesting and impactful conversation. So we're so grateful again to Dr. Erin Vogel from USC for her insights and research. Thank you, everybody. Take care, stay well, and we will send some resources to you in a follow-up email. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.